Hello Internet! My name is Patrick and this is Fringeworthy, a show where I talk to you about weird magic decks. And today we're talking about another legacy deck, a cool Nickfit Sultai bug build that really pushes plus one plus one counters to their extreme. Let's take a look. Alright, so let's look at the list that I'm calling Simnickfit. Well, since Simnickfit is a Nickfit deck, it starts out with the core of any Nickfit deck. Veteran Explorers, Cabal Therapies, and Phyrexian Towers. In my case, I'm actually running two Phyrexian Towers in this list. As for what makes this list special, I've got two Doubling Seasons and two Simic Ascendancies. This is our main core of what makes the deck tick. Simic Ascendancy is there as a way to dump our late game mana and as an alternate win con. The Doubling Season only further speeds up this process. For example, with both in play, I can activate Simic Ascendancy to put a plus one plus one counter on a creature. Doubling Season will instead make it so I put two counters on that creature. Simic Ascendancy will see that I put two counters on a creature and attempt to put two growth counters on itself. Doubling Season will step in again and put four growth counters on the Simic Ascendancy. This means we're only five quick activations away from winning the game. Beyond that, we've got other ways to ramp up our counter production. Winding Constrictor, which does have a downside I'll touch on later, and Peer. Both of them will put extra counters on your creatures, but Peer is the only creature that will put extra counters on your Simic Ascendancy. And since we're running Peer, we're also running Toothy. One quick note on things to be careful about Toothy, make sure you don't let him grow too big, otherwise you'll draw out your entire deck when he dies. Some other creatures we run that use plus one plus one counters are Scavenging Ooze and Tireless Tracker. Both of them are just good cards that happen to use plus one plus one counters, so we're running them. As for some of the more special and unique cards we're running, we've got a Galloping Lizrog, a Colonian Hydra, and a Vastwood Hydra. Galloping Lizrog is great because it can double the counters that have already been placed, so even if we don't have a doubling season, we've got another way of quickly getting a lot of counters out. The Colonian Hydra is itself just a really good finisher, and it can improve the power of any of our other plus one plus one counter based creatures. And of course we've got a Vastwood Hydra that has a modular like ability, where when it dies you can move those counters somewhere else. With so many sack outlets, this is another way to double dip on the counters. All these aside though, we do have the one crowning gem creature of the deck, Hydroid Krasis. It slices, it dices, it flies, it tramples, it draws cards, it gains life. It is a beast of a card. It does so many things for the deck. It's a consistent beater in the air, it can block Delvers if X is greater than 4. It is all in all a powerhouse of a creature. We're running three of them. I'd run more if they weren't $40 a piece right now. Rounding out the list, we've got four Green Sun Zeniths, a bit more than I've run in the past, but there's a lot of great tutor targets, a Dried Arbor, obviously, and some Sylvan Libraries, which are very good with Toothy. Now for removal, we're running one Abrupt Decay and three Assassin's Trophies. You can do a 2-2 split if you're feeling more that way. Abrupt Decay still, I think, has a place in destroying chalices, so I like to keep at least one around. Also, though not removal, put it here, a Diabolic Intent, just as a catch-all tutor. If you've got another one of Spicy card in mind, this would be the slot to put it in. The land base is pretty straightforward, one of each of the duels, a smattering of basics, and some fetches. Now onto the sideboard. Starting out, we've got some great Green Sun Zenith targets. Leovold against blue decks, Rexage against artifacts and enchantments, and Eternal Witness to get back things if our opponents have mostly kill spells rather than exile spells. Leyline of the Void, obviously, for graveyard decks, and our slicing dicing Swiss Army Knife sideboard card, Golgari Charm. Some of you might have been wondering, hey, where are the pernicious deeds? Well, they're sitting right here in the sideboard. I find that I bring them in against a lot of matches, but not every match, and I don't miss them too much in game one. You could probably find a spot for them in the main deck, but I haven't quite yet, so they're living in the sideboard for now. Now the last three cards that I have here are Underrealm Lich, Rite of Consumption, and Muldrotha. These are my personal choices here, because these spots are really FLEX SLOTS in your sideboard. You can use these to adapt to whatever your local metagame is. For me, I felt a need to play more against grindy decks, so I have Underrealm Lich for getting maximum value off of my Sylvan Libraries, Muldrotha for being able to recur anything from my graveyard, and Rite of Consumption as a quick sort of combo kill with large creatures. Now let's talk about some matchups. First up, I want to talk about Death and Taxes. Death and Texas is a pretty decent matchup for us. We've got a lot of ways to interact with their creatures, we can make gigantic creatures that they can't do much about other than swords them, and they don't have a lot of great answers to our Simic Ascendancy. That said, there are some things we really need to be careful about, mostly Mirren Crusaders. They have protection from pretty much every creature in our deck, and most of our removal. Well, all of our removal, actually. 
So getting rid of those with Cabal therapies is very, very important. Something that can happen frequently against death and taxes is that the board state will stall. In this case, you shouldn't fret or worry too much. We'll eventually be able to ramp into more mana and have even larger creatures than they can deal with. Death and taxes isn't known for having high toughness creatures, so we'll be able to trample over with many of our options. Taking a look at Miracles, it's also not the best matchup for us, mostly because they have counter magic and basic lands. One thing to keep in mind playing against Miracles is being careful when we're ramping them. A lot of other decks, we don't have to worry about that so much, since they're not running as many basics, so we can just sack our veteran explorers to our heart's content. But with Miracles, they'll be able to keep pace with us for quite a while. It's very important if you're using Cabal Therapy to always name Brainstorm first. If you don't, they'll be able to use it to hide any key cards in their hand for the second flashback. That said, once we've established ourselves on the board, there's not a whole lot that Miracles can do to stop us. They do have some counter magic, but one of the advantages we have over them is they might not know what exactly in our deck to counter. So be sure to be coy about what the deck does and hope they don't figure it out. Lastly, let's talk about Infect. This is probably the worst possible matchup for the deck. You know why I mentioned before that Winding Constrictor does have some downsides? Well, here it is. Winding Constrictor will increase the number of poison counters that Infect creatures place on you. Always be sure to board out your Winding Constrictors against Infect. Because of this, the deck doesn't ramp on counters nearly quickly enough against Infect and quickly folds to this fast, aggressive combo. There are some things that we can do, like bringing in our Golgari Charms and Pernicious Deeds to deal with lots of their small creatures, and also, if you want to use one of your flex spots in your sideboard, maybe run Malira. If you're planning on taking this to a tournament or your local scene and there's a lot of people playing Infect, I would recommend against playing Simnic Fit. But if there's only a couple Infect players, maybe the Malira in the sideboard's enough for you, or you just hope to never get matched against them. Well, that about wraps up this episode of Fringeworthy. If you like the video and you want to see more deck techs like it, please subscribe to the channel. I'll be posting at least nine more deck techs this year. That's the goal. Uh, also, down in the description, you can find my Twitter. Uh, I tweet anytime I'm going to go live doing magic-related things on Twitch, whether that be on my own channel, also in the description, or playing in Card Kingdom's weekly or monthly legacy tournaments. Also in the comments, if you've got any questions about this deck, or any decks you want to see me play, or suggestions for cards, or formats, anything, please leave it down there. I do read all the comments. I really appreciate the time that you've taken to watch this video. It really brings me joy that, I'll, that hopefully I'm bringing joy to you through these videos. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.